uh, speak, speaking to us uh, this evening. So Professor Porel is a senior researcher, uh, director de recherche at the Institut de Recherche et d'Histoire de Texte at the um, Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. And he is also director of the Institut, Institut d'Etudes Médiévales at the Institut Catholique de Paris. He has been actively engaged in the intellectual history of the Middle Ages, um, particularly the, uh, the great 12th century uh, Renaissance, uh, the, the schools of um, Saint-Victor and Chartres, the Franciscan authors of the 13th century, uh, and in particular, the Latin reception of um, pseudo Dennis. Um, he works very closely with Latin philology and textual criticism and paleography. Um, and among publications that we might mention are the critical edition of Hugh of St. Victor's commentary on pseudo Dionysius's celestial hierarchy and a companion book on this commentary, The Symbole et des Anges, Hugues de Saint-Victor et le Reve Denisien um, um, of uh, Tournaud uh, 2013. So um, it's with uh, very great pleasure and anticipation that we uh, await your talk, Professor Poirot. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And I'm very honored to, to speak uh, in front of you. Uh, I forgot to ask, uh, is, have I the possibility of sharing my screen? Of course, I can make you co-host. Because I you... will have a PowerPoint, which will be more interesting than my <laughs> Okay, now you, you should be able to share your screen. I made you co-host. <laughs> So I think that should be. There is a green button in the center at the bottom of your. Yes. OK, great. Do you see it? Yep. So. Uh, and OK. Well, said Dionysus, this mysterious author who around Anno Domini composed a corpus inspired by the Neoplatonist thought of Proclus and the Cappadocian Fathers is supposed to have had an immense influence on the philosophy and theology of the Western Middle Ages. It would be a mistake, however, however to think that this influence was immediate, general, and simple. Although translated as early as the 9th century, it was not until the 12th and 13th century that the texts, concepts, and theories of Pseudodonius became popular amongst the Latin readers, not without significant distortions from Dionysius' original doctrine. I would like to describe the story of this slow, gradual, and sometimes surprising reception in order to better analyze the multiform impact that the Corpus Dionysiacum has long had and per perhaps still has on Western thought. First, I will trace the stages of its reception in the Latin West. Then I will show the major role played by the commentary of Hugh of St. Victor in the first half of the 12th century. Finally, I will examine three main aspects of the influence that the Dionysian text exerted from the 12th to the 15th century. Uh, when did the medieval West receive the text and thought of pseudo Dionysius the Aeropagite? Three answers can be given to this simple question in the 6th, 9th, and 12th century, each with its own truth. I would like to show that if we have to wait until the 12th, and especially the 13th century for Dionysian works 
and doctrines to emerge from a small cenacle of often Hellenistic scholars, the notion of hierarchy benefited before the Dionysian revival of the 12th century from additional channels of diffusion, independent of the diffusion and knowledge of the Areopagitic corpus, and which had a lasting influence on its meaning. Let us begin by describing the three moments when the Dionysian corpus came knocking on the door of the Latin West. In the sixth century, the future Pope Gregory the Great, an embassy in Constantinople, got wind of the Dionysian doctrines that had appeared at the beginning of the century. In 593, having become Pope, he referred explicitly in his 34th homily on, on the Gospels to, I quote, Dionysius the Areopagite, ancient and venerable father, concerning a division of labor between the higher angels who contemplate God and the lower angels on mission to man. Rather than Gregory, it seems that it was Maximus the Confessor, dead 662, who brought the first known Greek manuscript of the Areopagic Corpus from Greece to the West. In any case, its existence is attested as early as 649, when during the Lateran Synod, Pope Martin I had the Dionysian Codex brought to him. From that moment on, various clues documented continued presence in Rome, a quotation in a letter, uh, quotations in diverse letters of popes or in councils, and generally in a canonical context. In the ninth century, another famous Greek manuscript of the Dionysian Corpus reached the West, this time in Gaul, at the Frankish court. It is the famous Grecus 437 of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, which in 827 was offered by ambassadors of the Byzantine Emperor Michael II the Big Wild to his Western counterpart, Louise the Pius, at the Palace of Compiègne. This manuscript was given to the Abbey of Saint Denis, then directed by Hilduin, advisor to the Emperor. It was the eve of the feast of Saint Denis, evangelizer of the Parisians and patron saint of the monastery. This event solemnized the coagulation of the two Denis Dionysus already affirmed by the Latins in previous passiones of the saint and probably also accepted by the Greeks. This probably explained the choice of the ambassadors at a time when the two empires wanted to reach agreement on the question of images, it was important to affirm an ancestral link between Athens and Gaul. It was, it was from this Byzantine manuscript that the first translations were made, that of Hilduin in 832-35, and above all that of John Scotus around 862. Even if the latter improves on the former, both offer a text that is incomprehensible to anyone who doesn't already have the keys to the Dionysian universe. In addition to the extreme difficulties of a deliberately esoteric Greek original, the two Latin versions preserve the lexicon and syntax of the Greek codex already burdened with copying errors and add their own translation errors. Around 875, Anastasius, the librarian, criticized the Erigenian version and enriched it with a set of corrections taken from a Roman version of, a Greek, of the Greek text and marginal glosses translated by him from two Greek exegetes John of Cytopolis, first half of the sixth century, and Maximus the Confessor. An excellent Hellenist, Anastasius judged the work of the Ariogen severely. Uh, yes, here are the, the glosses. 
the, the er Eugena, he said, had placed the Dionysian text to the point that the one he had undertaken to translate, she rendered such, he says, that it still had to be translated. Two and a half centuries later, William of Maltzbury, dead 1143, similarly declared that one can hardly understand the Latin text, which is constructed more according to the flu of the Greek language than according to our, our order of words. It was not until the 12th century and even more so in the 13th century that Latin speaking scholars began to take hold of the Dionysian corpus for good, to read it, discuss it, compare it with the Latin fathers and incorporate its texts, concepts and theories into their doctrinal synthesis. A decisive role in this development was played by Hugh of Saint Victor, who left a widely distributed commentary on the celestial hierarchy, 130 handwritten copies subsist of it. Where Eudena had scrupulously preserved the Hellenism and neologism of his favorite author, Hugh decodes and reformulates them. At the risk of watering down the Dionysian thesis, he expresses them in a language more familiar to readers steeped in Augustinianism. As a result, Dionysian texts and theories began to spread in cloisters and schools. The movement of assimilation was launched. Nothing could stop it. In the 1160s, a third more comprehensible translation was produced at the request of John of Salisbury by John Sarrazin, who completed it with commentaries. Around uh, 1240, a fourth excellent translation was produced by Robert Grostet, who added scolia translated from Greek and explanatory notes. Around the same time, the Victorian Thomas Gallus uh, who lived in the Abbey of Vercelli in Italy, devoted himself to providing the Dionysian corpus with a triple exegetical apparatus, glosses, literal glosses, Greek commentary, and what he calls extratio, that is a paraphrase. In Paris, an instrument was set up, the Dionysian corpus of the University of Paris, a sort of ordinary gloss, on the Areopagitic writings. From place to place, we recognize in a larger writing the Dionys Dionysian text of the celestial hierarchy. Following each sentence are presented except from all the available exegetical materials. Scolia's, scolia extracted and translated by Anastasius the librarian from John of Citopolis and Maximus the Con to the name of Maximus, and alternating sections of commentary by Hugh of Saint Victor, John Scotus, Eriogena, and John Sarazin. This is followed work by work by all or part of the translations and commentaries available on the other Dionysian texts. In this way, in the age of the universities, the Areopagitic corpus, which had previously been an illustrious and little known figure, became in the space of a few generations, a first rate source in theology, almost on a par with Augustine or Aristotle. His vocabulary and doctrine spread widely in philosophy, theology and spirituality. Until the end of the Middle Ages and beyond, he remained very influential if, even after Lorenzo Valla questioned the Areopagitic authenticity of the Dionysian corpus. However, the difficulties of interpretation raised by the text were so great that each successive thinker, John Scotus, Joseph Saint Victor, Robert Grostet, Thomas Gallus, Albert the Great, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, Master Eckhart, Hugh of Balma, and so on, 
tended to take Jainism theories into their own hands. There were thus as many Jainisms as there were readers of Pseudo Dionysus. Between the second and the third entries of the Pseudo Dionysus, we observe then a paradox. Although many Latin authors quote the name of Dionysus, refer to his books, and give themselves the impression of having read him, the number of manuscripts giving access to them is ridiculously small. Hildwin's version is in fact preserved in three cop cop copies from the 12th and 15th centuries, only one of which is complete. John Scotus' version is transmitted in much more manuscript, but only 12 of them date back to the 9th, 11th century, two in Gaul, two in Italy, one in England, another in Catalogne, and the last six in Germanic lands. And the only existing commentary, the Expositiones of Eugena on Celestial Hierarchy, was disseminated in about 20 witnesses, of which only one is prior to 1100, uh, yes, mutilated by a good third, third, like all the other manuscripts except one. The Dionysian corpus was therefore very little accessible. So, especially in France, it was very difficult to access the text of Pseudo Dionysus. This codicological observation is corroborated by two others of different but concordant natures. A survey of electronic concordances shows, without appeal, that before the 12th century, the Dionysian vocabulary, though so singular and recognizable, left almost no trace outside its, its translators. On the other hand, the doctrines transmitted under the name of the Europagites have little to do with his real thought while none of his distinctive theories on the hierarchical staging of the celestial spirits, on the superiority of dissimilar images, on theophanies, on divine unknowing, on mystical theology is known or faithfully transmitted. So what happened during the 9th and 12th century? Where does this contrast between apparent knowledge and real ignorance come from? The explanation is simple. Since the Dionysian corpus was almost impossible to find, and since his texts were almost unintelligible due to the fourfold fact of his confusing thought for Augustinian readers, his deliberately obscure language, even in Greek, the translation principles of Hilduin and John Scotus and the inevitable errors in copying or punctuation in Greek as well as in Latin, it was not these texts that were read, but others instead. The saint and prestigious thinker was admired from afar, but access to his writing was too difficult. An anecdote sums up the situations well. In his life of Saint Mayol, Cyrus, a Cluniac monk, recounts the mir one miracle. His hero, Saint Mayol, passing through Cluny, had found there the, one of the very few manuscripts of the hierarchies of blessed Dionysus, Areopagite. The Burgundian Abbey is indeed one of the two places in Gaul where it's possible. As he read it at, by night, by candlelight, the candle burned down completely while he was sleeping without burning the page on which it was played. As Edouard Jeunot jokingly observes, this miracle may prove the sanctity of the book and the reader, but it hardly convinces of the reader's interest in the book. For three, Centuries, therefore, Dionysian studies like Mayol were asleep. Unable to access Pseudo Dionysus' writing, the Latin readers fell back 
on three other texts that seem to reflect his thinking. First, of course, the biblical verse, Acts 17.34, set the scene. It placed Dionysus in Athens on the Areopagus hill in the company of philosophers, which quite quickly suggested that he was one himself. Secondly, the mention of Gregory the Great in the homily on the Gospels gave partial but widespread information on angels, which was hastily taken up, placing them under the name of Dionysius, whereas in reality, Gregory's conception were very different to those of Pseudo Dionysius. Unlike the latter, he saw in the division of the angels into choirs, a hierarchy not of natures, but of functions. Moreover, his lists of angelic choirs diverge from those of Pseudo Dionysius, a convenient clue for us uh, to determine who really read Dionysius and who is quoting him secondhand. Finally, Hilduin of Saint Denis offered in his uh, Passio Dionysi a very rich and influential dossier on the supposed author of the Dionysian corpus. In his double life of Dionysus in prose and in poetry, the second of which has recently, well, both of them have recently been published by Michael Lapidge, the second for the first time. In the prose passion, Hilduin not only assembles a rich dossier of historical and hagiographical sources, but also argues for the, the, the identity of the three Dionysi, the convert of Saint Paul, mentioned in the Act of the Apostles, the author of the corpus handed down under his name, which Christianized, Christianized the thought of the Neoplatonic philosopher Proclus, and the first bishop of Paris, Cephalophorian martyr and patron of the royal abbey of Saint Denis. In addition to the life of the saint, Hilduin provided in chapters 9 to 16 emphatic but misleading summaries of the four treatises and ten letters of Pseudo Dionysus. The theologian of dissimilar images, apophaticism, and divine unknowing appeared in contrast as a man who, having, I quote, placed his mouth in heaven flew there by the wing of heaven, that is, by the grace of a most venerable revelation, and having tasted there not only those mysteries and ministrations of the Holy Spirit, but also the true savor of the eternal divinity, belched out in writing for human knowledge unheard of revelations about the angelic world and about God himself. Since Hildwin's passion enjoyed a huge circulation, nearly 200 manuscripts have been preserved, and also provide the liturgical reading for the same feast day, many Latin scholars relied on it to refer to their Reopagic corpus as if they had read it. Among many others, let us mention Notker the Begar, a bon of Saint German, Adalberon of Lens. Humbert of Silva Candida, Yves of Chartres, Guibert of Nogent, Rupert of Deutz, Peter Abelard himself, who gamely refuted the identity of Dionysus Aeropagite with Saint Denis of Paris, before retracting when he discovered his source, Beda, was wrong. He, Beda was right to say it's not the same, but he had bad reasons. So, Abelard never doubted that the author of the Arapagite corpus was the disciple of Saint Paul. He says, the greatest of philosophers and the apostle of the Gauls. Even Peter Lombard, in the middle of the 12th century, refers to Dionysus the Arapagite in his sentences, that it is to pass under his label what he had read in Gregory the Great. As for those who, apart from the translators or revisers, uh, it, that is Hilduin, Eriogegenan, and Hanastasu, really read 
the Dionysian corpus and understood it enough to make authentic quotation, there are very few number. In the ninth century, three timid occurrences are found in Inkmar of Reims, former close friend of Hilduin and protector of Eriugena, and a few others like uh, in Eric of Auxerre, probably through Eriugena. In the 10th century, a reminiscence in Fulbert of Chartres. Others, finally, in the 11th century, in Autelon of Saint Emran and Gerard of Chana, the Venetian Hellenist, who seems to quote directly from Greek without going through the Latin version. And that's all for about it for three centuries. What makes the illusion that the Pseudo Dionysus was read in this period is that the authors of the time, especially monks, present in their writings many themes with a Neoplatonic flavor, opposition of the one and the many, metaphysics of light, flight from the sensible, contemplation of the intelligible, ascent towards divine beauty, nostalgia for heaven, imitation of angelic spirits. However, as Andreas Speer has shown with regard to a sujet of Saint-Denis, these themes are omnipresent among early Christian authors, and they are not specific to the Areopagites. The fact that in the absence of the works themselves, these early Christian authors have been used to reconstruct a Dionysian that is more fantasized than read is quite understandable, but leads to a misinterpretation. If for example, the Dionysian corpus presents an originality on the theme of light. It's precisely in that it discredits luminous images in order to speak of God and the celestial court and affirms, on the contrary, the superiority of dissimilar images over similar ones like light. Similarly, medieval spirituality manifests a strong monastic desire to lead an angelic life in order to join the citizens of heaven. The fascination with angels is therefore not a theme specific to Sodo Dionysus. It is found, found everywhere, where the theme of flight from the world and the idol of virginity dominate, including long before Sodo Dionysus among the early church fathers. On the other hand, the idea, the idea that men could mingle with angels contradicts the very principle of the Dionysian hierarchy, since it admits mixing only between successive hierarchical levels. From one order to another, the same divine gifts circulate, but each one receives them in proportion to what he is, he or she is. Not everything that is Neoplatonic is therefore Dionysian, and here, more than elsewhere, we must be wary of imprecise resemblances. So, before few, very few, had read the writing of Sodo Dionysus apart from the translated. Thanks to Hugh commentary, of which more than 120 manuscript copies survive from the 12th centuries through, through 16th century, K. Dionysian themes, such as the hierarchical structure of the universe, of the universe symbolic theology, negative theology, mystical theology, became popular among Latin theologians, and in less than a century obtained among them an authority almost equal to that of Augustine or Aristotle. So I would like now to ask why well, was this commentary so successful? Apart, but first let us say some words about the, the commentary himself. A part of the reasons are connected to Hu himself. After many debates, it's now clear that Hu of Saint Victor was of Saxon origins. It has been long debated. The French thought he was French and German thought he was German, of course. And now it's clear that he was German and Saxon and that he his training was uh, in, in Saxony. So that's important for our question because in the 12th century, the 
most of the Dionysian manuscripts available were in the empire. There were very few in France. I, I, so, and when we look at the works of so the of, uh, of Saint Victor, we see that there is uh, many topics close to Dionysian theories, but in a very discreet way as if he had time to assimilate these terms and make them his own, to mix them with Augustinian theories. We don't see in the evolu literary evolution a, a break before and after he commented on the celestial hierarchy. Another, on another hand, it seems that there was a general expectation for a rediscovery of the reopagitic corpus. In the 20s of the 12th century, we observe a concentration of events connected with the name of Pseudogenesis, and which associate, first of all, Hugh of Saint Victor and Peter Bellard, then Suger, abbot of Saint Denis, Honorius Augustodenensis in Bavaria, then little, but little a growing number of Latin scholars, for instance, in the entourage of Thierry of Chartres, of John of Salisbury, of Alan of Lille, so that at the end of the 12th century, Sododonisus has become a rather frequently quoted author, whereas, whereas at the beginning of the 12th century, he was not quoted at all directly. The first known trace as far as I know, is in the Didascalicon when Hughes, so about 1120, before uh, the, the first condemnation of Abelard in 1121, when Hugh adds without known precedent, Sodo Dionysus to the Decretum Gelasianum, that is an ancient list of authoritative authors in theological matters. So, I think that there was a hue of Saxon origin and coming to Paris brought an interest for something that was rare, but more available in, in the empire. And there were precedents with a law of saint Emeran, for instance. Why now was Hugh's commentary so successful? In my opinion, there, the answer is, is due to three indispensable skills for dealing with the Sado Dionysus that had by chance of Saint Victor. He is an exeget, he's a theologian, and he's a pedagogue. He's an exeget in the most complete way possible. Not only did he leave a great number of works commenting on scripture in all possible ways, literal glosses, continuous commentary, according to the three senses of scriptures or according to one sense, especially in-depth commentary on isolated verses or of liturgical antiphons taken from the, the Bible. But he also reflected at length on the theory of exegesis in four successive texts, with a constant concern to adapt the exegetical method to the particularities of the text commented on. For instance, he's famous in the history of exegesis for having clearly reaffirmed in the tradition of Jerome that the explanation of the, of the text in its prim primary sense, the historical sense, is fundamental, and that it is indispensable to understand the text, first of all, in its own logic at the first degree, before eventually moving on to allegorical or tropological explanation. It is this preoccupation with understanding the text, first of all, for its own sake, that makes him, for instance, use Hebrew versions of the Bible and rabbinic commentaries on it to better understand what the text of the Old Testament mean. So his attention to the text in itself, in its consistency, I think was a, a good uh, quality to confront with Dionysus. Second, 
is a theologian who has shown in other cases his ability to reflect on complex doctrinal questions. And this is, of course, indispensable when one confronts an author like Pseudotonesus, who is already difficult in himself, in Greek, but even more difficult for Latin minds trained in Augustinianism, and who must moreover confront the Dionysian text through the distorting prism of a translation sometimes too literally faithful. For instance, the Greek word ukun has been awkwardly translated non ergo, therefore not, by eriogena, while in the text it means only therefore, without negation. And without knowledge of Greek, Hugh was able, uh, through the intelligence of the text in itself, to detect that this non ergo uh, should be corrected uh, in ergo. And six times he emits non ergo, and each time he finds a, a way to, 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 to give an explanation uh, that uh, abolish the, the negation. So his talent as a theologian was a great help. But third, and maybe it's more important, he is a pedagogue, which means that he has a deep reluctance to formulate in a complicated way what can be said in the simplest words. In a sense, this creates a real cultural and intellectual gap with Pseudotonesus, who is an almost hermetic author who constantly resorts to neologism and complex syntax in the conviction that the difficulty of language is necessary to respect the mystery of a transcendent God. Despite this deliberate obscurity on the part of the author, Hughes' pedagogical tendency prevailed and he implemented a gradual exegesis of which, of which I would like to give an example. In the example you see, the commented section of Sodotonisus is the object of a quadruple treatment. First, Hugh quotes it literally. I translated as close as possible to the Latin text, and you can see that it's almost incomprehensible. Then he gives the general idea, linking it to what has just been said. So we have the consistency of of the chapter uh, and the connection with what has been said. Thirdly, it takes up the word of the text, but replacing them in a more comprehensible order, more familiar to Latin readers, and explaining, explaining each word or group of words with short glosses. Uh, it is uh, namely, which make it possible to understand in what sense the difficult or ambiguous words must be interpreted. Finally, returning to the main idea of the text, he comments on it, sometimes discusses it by making a long digression in which he gives his opinion, often also by bringing together the particular idea expressed in this piece of sentence with the more general ideas of the Dionysian treatise. In short, Hugh Saint Victor does not confine himself to the philological detail of Greek terms translated into Latin, nor does he scheme of other texts to discuss the theological thesis of Pseudotonesus, but by a systematic back and forth between the words of the text and the general meaning of the treatise, he strives at each stage to understand the text in its own logic with a constant effort to render, it, to render it clearly with simple words. And that, I think, explains the large diffusion this commentary obtained, as we shall see. To measure the impact that the commentary of Hugh Saint Victor has exerted on Dionysian studies from the 12th century, we have several complementary means. First, there is the handwritten transmission of the commentary of Hugh, 
than the handwritten transmission of the Jonison corpus itself, the other commentaries, which were written after that of you, and finally the real assimilation of Jonison doctrines. From Hugh's commentary, 11, uh, 121 manuscripts are preserved, which are unequally divided in time and space. In the 12th century, the commentary spread to the regions most sensitive to Victorian influence, Paris, Northern France, England, and the Southern regions of the empire, Bavaria, and of all Austria. In the 13th century, it affects the first universities, Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, mainly. In the 14th century, the commentary was copied by less, as it is the case for all the authors prior to the time of the universities. Nevertheless, there is a new interest for the commentary in the Netherlands. This new interest is reinforced in the 15th century in the Netherlands and the Rhineland, two regions from which the Devotio Moderna emerged, as well as in Austria. So if we juxtapose all the copies of the last four centuries of the Middle Ages, we see that the commentary has won a vast success, but especially in the northern half of Europe. In the southern half of Europe, only Italy welcomed it a bit, and this was especially the case in the Franciscan world under the influence of Bonaventure. This influence of Hughes' commentary benefits the commented work. I, I told you that there were very few uh, manuscripts before the 12th century. Suddenly, in the 12th century, the copying of the Jonison corpus increases significantly, even without reaching the number of copies of Hughes' commentary. I've identified 17 Jonison manuscripts for 12th century, and it increases uh, after. On a, another hand, new commentaries are written by the same time. Uh, only for the 12th century, after Hughes and Victor, you have two lost commentaries, but John Saracenus, uh, William of Luca, and after that, in the 13th century, uh, many commentaries by Robert Grostet, Albert the Great, Thomas Gallus, Thomas Aquinas on divine names, and it goes on. Dionysus at that time has truly become a major authority. However, the most decisive criterion for observing the real assimilation of the Dionysian corpus and its studies remains the place given to its theories and concepts. Given the singularity of the Dionysian lexicon, the concordance make it easy to measure with precision the way in which the concepts of pseudodonisus were taken up by medieval authors. You remember from the 9th to the 11th century, only five authors had been identified apart from the translators themselves to make room in their writing for the characteristic terms of pseudodonisus. From the 12th century, they become more and more numerous. I've counted 30 for the 12th century, first in St. Victor, then in the various religious family, and among, especially those connected with St. Victor or authors that were influenced by the Victorian authors. And little after little, uh, it touches uh, secular master and clerics. And after, in the 30th century, well, there is no sense in uh, sensing the authors, uh, every theologian uh, knows, quotes, uses uh, the Jonison terms uh, and doctrines. Now, in this last part, I would like to ask myself basically what has the reception of Sododonisus changed in the medieval West? What happened? that wouldn't have happened without his reading? This is obviously a difficult question because the Jonison influence is multifaceted. Given the strangeness of the text, each author tends to assimilate 
them to his own thought. So we see a multitude of very different Dionysism proliferate. For example, in the Dominican order alone, great is a difference in the interpretation and use made of Dionysian theories by authors such as Albert the Great, Aquinas, and Master Eckhart. And the same could be said of each other school. This makes it uneasy to give an overall picture of the doctrinal influence exerted by the Dionysian corpus on medieval thinkers. Another difficulty come, comes from the fact that the Dionysian influence is broad. It affects the most diverse fields, of course, theology, but also metaphysics, spirituality, and one may add again the theories of language with the question raised by Pseudotonisus of the validity of what our language is when applied to God. Politics, since the Dionysian notion of hierarchy is very quickly transposed from the angelic or ecclesiastical domain into that of the state, and even the history of art, and in particular of architecture, is affected by the reception of the Dionysian corpus, since specialists discuss extensively the influence exerted by the Dionysian corpus in the aesthetic field on the birth of a Gothic style via the texts of Abbot Suger and those of Saint Victor. The controversies between specialists on the reality of the Dionysian influence on the beginning of Gothic architecture seems to me typical of the difficulty one encounters when one wants to prove this influence. It's indeed necessary to clearly distinguish which, what surely comes from the pseudo Dionysus of what is more broadly Neoplatonic and which could therefore have been known without pseudo Dionysus through other representatives of Neoplatonism, such as the fathers of the church, Augustine, Ambrose, or Marius Victorinus and others, philosophers from late antiquity like Calcidius, Boesius, Macrobius, and even from the Middle Ages like Eriogena. In addition, many works are still unpublished. For example, the commentaries of John Sarazin. It is therefore difficult to make a synthesis on the influence of Pseudotonesus on the medieval West. I will therefore I will nevertheless try my hand at it, asking you in advance for your indulgence. Let us start with a somewhat surprising observation. Even from the 12th century, the reception of Pseudo Dionysus took place gradually in three main stages, which curiously follow the order of the Dionysian corpus. The Dionysus corpus in the Latin medieval manuscript transcribes the text as follows. First, the two hierarchies, celestial and ecclesiastical, then the divine names, then the mystical theology, and finally the 10 letters. Of these various, various elements, three, corresponds to the three successive phases in the assimilation of Dionysian doctrines, as if readers had mostly read them in the order of their transcription within the, the Latin manuscript of the Dionysian corpus. First, the celestial hierarchy, which is the subject of several commentaries in the 12th century. Then divine names, very influential in the 13th century, it's, for example, the only work commented on by Thomas Aquinas. Finally, in the last two centuries of the Middle Ages, 14th, 15th century, mystical theology took a major place in connection with the theories of Rhineland theologian, such as Meister Eckhart and the Devotio Moderna. I will therefore develop the Tunisian influence in three parts corresponding to these three works. So first, angels and hierarchy. The question of angels hierarchy, hierarchies is posed in particular in the celestial hierarchy. The first work in the corpus is indeed this text. As the name suggests, 
it deals with the angelic world, but it doesn't deal with angels alone, for it's preceded by three chapters which are not devoted to the angels, but rather to the Dionysian hierarchical system as a whole. Mul chapter one, multiplicity of divine illumination. Chapter two, similar and dissimilar symbols. And ch chapter three, nature and function of the hierarchy. This, moreover, explains why the celestial hierarchy comes first in medieval Latin manuscripts. Following the example of the Greek Codex offered to Louis the Pius, this treatise begins with broader developments which can serve as an introduction to the anti corpus. The most apparent object of the heavenly hierarchy are, of course, the angels. However, on the angels, the Dionysian corpus doctrine brings important changes compared to the Latin doctrine. Uh, prior to the knowledge of Dionysus. Some of these changes are superficial, others are more profound. I begin with the most superficial and most obvious change. It is the list of angelic orders that Pseudo Dionysus gives, uh, which is different one from the one that was in favor until then. The list that is the least, or rather the least transmitted by Pope Gregory the Great. You see, uh, Seraphine Cherubim has the same place, so Archangel and Angel, but in between the, the orders are listed in a diverse way. This is very useful because it helps to recognize whether an author, when he speaks of the angel, has read the Pseudo Dionysus or not. But, of course, it's not so important. Another different divergence between the Dionysian and Gregorian angelologies concerns the significance of this classification. Does the, the, the classification distinguish natures or functions? In other words, is the distinction between all these kinds of angels strict? and permanent or flexible and temporary. For Gregory and the Latin tradition, which relies on particular passage of Bible, Isaiah, Hebrews, it's purely functional, such that the same celestial spirits can sometimes be called angels and sometimes seraphim, according to the mission the spirit is performing or uh, mission to, towards human people or contemplation of God. For Dionysus, on the other hand, for, for grand other passage from Bible, Daniel especially, this classification is strict. It corresponds to an inequality among substances. Between God and the human, there is an ontological graduation represented by the diversity of the angelic world from the highest essences, seraphim, to the lowest angels in the strict sense. According to its proximity to God, each heavenly spirit is therefore more or less excellent, both in its being as well as in its activity. It's therefore impossible for a cel celestial spirit to leave its natural category in order to fulfill a function allotted to another just as it would be impossible for a human to, became, to become an angel or vice versa. Another difference with Dionysus, we go from a monastic angelology to a clerical angelology. Before, in the Gregorian model, the angel was the idol model of the monk, the model of a life of escape or contempt of the world and matter, to devote oneself to the contemplation of God in solitude, far from sensible realities. The world of human beings and that of angelic spirits were therefore not separated. On the contrary, human beings had the hope through the monastic way to live an angelic life and to join the angelic spirits 
at the end in the celestial Jerusalem. The notion of hierarchy was therefore not very important since it was bound to disappear in the celestial Jerusalem. What matters, on the other hand, is the break between the present world and the world to come, between material realities and spiritual realities, between good and evil. The Gregorian angelology was ascetic and eschatologic. On the contrary, Dionysian angelology is strongly hierarchical. No direct contact is possible between the superior angels and the human world, but the divine illuminations can only be transmitted from superior angels to inferior angels by intermediate angels, and they by angels the lowest to the highest men, prelates, who transmit this divine illumination to other men through the ecclesial hierarchy and the sacraments. Dionysian angelology is therefore received in the West as a clerical angelology, which highlights the priesthood as a means of deifying the anti-human world. Not only it is in its spiritual dimension, but also in its bodily dimension. The angel is therefore no longer the ideal model of the monk who flees the world, but the ideal model of the cleric, intermediary between God and the world to transform it through his priestly ministry. Or again, the angel is the ideal model of a very particular type of cleric, the master, the doctor, whose function is to enlighten other men, other people by his teaching. It is there, one suspects, a model that was to find its full meaning in the universities created in the 13th century. Precisely this transition from a Gregorian angelology to a Dionysian angelology coincides with a change in society. Those who henceforth forth are authorities in matters of teaching and in particular sacred teaching, they are no longer monks like Saint Anselm, Saint Bernard, but clerics, secular priests like Peter Lombard, or at least regular canons like Hugh and Richard of Saint Victor, while waiting for the beggars of the 13th century like Albert and Thomas Aquinas among Dominicans, Alexander of Hayes and Bonaventure among Franciscans. The transition from a Gregorian angelology to a Dionysian angelology therefore favored the birth of universities as an institutional and intellectual power and also favored the, the spring of mendicant orders. The notion of hierarchy of which we have spoken doesn't only concern the angelic world. It extends first to people, since the celestial hierarchy is for Dionysus a model of a perfect society. It's surely no coincidence that interest in Dionysian text coincides with periods of empires. The Dionysian corpus was itself written around 500 when the Byzantine Empire was being built. It was introduced into the West in the ninth century at the time of Carolingian Empire. And its reading took off in the 12th century, which saw the rise of the Capetian monarchy, of the Plantagenet Empire, of the Gregorian reform of the church. In the civil as well as the ecclesiastical domain, the Dionysian model of hierarchy comes at the right time to support aspiration for the reinforcement of a central and so to speak pyramidal authority as the top of the feudal or ecclesial hierarchy. But the notion of hierarchy was also applied to many other fields such as psychology, since Thomas Gallus sees in the Nine Angelic Orders the model of a stratification of the soul and its ascent towards God. In fact, the notion of hierarchy may well be more than angels, the reason why the celestial hierarchy aroused such interest in the 12th century. What is fascinating about the notion of hierarchy? It is an organizing principle that has these three characteristics. It is unified, universal, 
and staggered. It is unified because it comes from the one and returns to the one, the unique origin and end of all that exists. It's universal because between this unique origin and end, it strives to encompass everything. It is staggered and layered because between the one and the totality, it grants a great place to intermediaries. If the notion of hierarchy met with great success in the 12th century, it was probably because it responded to an expectation. The 12th century was in fact the century of order in many areas, field of knowledge, profane as well as sacred. It was indeed the time when, starting with St. Victor, programs of profane and sacred studies were put in place, such as the famous Divisio Philosophiae of Hugh, including all profane knowledge, including even mechanical, that, that is to say, technical artists. And in the sacred order, Hugh is also the author of the first medieval psalm of theology. But this interest in arboreal division extends to many other domains, as shown by the division of the qualities of creatures in De Tribus Diebus, and we could give lots and lots of examples. The 12th century is also the time when we see the proliferation of tree diagrams in manuscripts. What a colleague, Ayelet Evenezra, uh, of Jerusalem uh, University re recently studied lines of thought, branching diagrams and the medieval mind with the notion of hierarchy transposed from society into knowledge, an arborescent ideal of knowledge spreads. To know is to insert the known object into a kind of thesaurus where it enters into relation direct or indirect, with all the rest of the knowable, thanks to a new network of tree-like relationship. This is one aspect, not the least, of the scholastic intellectual toolkit, the establishment of which is, I believe, largely reinforced by the reading of the Dionysian corpus, and especially of the celestial hierarchy. Uh, yes. In the 13th century, a second Dionysian treatise around the interest of theologians, the De Divinis Nominibus, commented on in particular by Robert Crostet, Thomas Gallus, Albert the Great, Thomas Aquino. This treatise depends a question already present in the celestial hierarchy. What is the value of the words that we use to name God? Sorry, this is... The main thesis is that there are two main theologies, that is two ways of speaking about God, cataphatic and apophatic, affirmative and negative. Affirmative theology says what God is, but in reality doesn't reach God himself, but his action towards creature as far as he is their creative cause. This is the case when it is said of God that he's powerful or just. It doesn't reach God's essence in itself, but just his action. Negative theology expresses itself more adequately towards God and his transcendent essence, because it says what God is not. It denies the affirmations made about him in order to discover a God always beyond what is said about him and thought. In reality, in Dionysus, there are two other theologies, two other ways of speaking of God, symbolic and mystical theology. Symbolic theology is a way in which creature themselves can be used as names of God in an improper but imaged way. And this is what scripture does abundantly, not only about God, but also all celestial realities like angels. It's indeed impossible for men or women, to express invisible realities without using visible images. To symbolic theology, figurative means of naming God, must therefore correspond a mode of exegesis which isolates the signified invisible quality 
from the visible symbol employed by the sacred author. Mystical theology is a sort of duplication of negative theology. After having rejected the affirmative names as being inadequate to the divine mystery, mystical theology rejects even the negative names. It's not enough to say that God is not corporal. One must further realize that even the word uncorporal is not enough to adequately account for what God is, who is always like the one of Patinus, beyond all determination, negative as well as affirmative, always beyond the division that the intellect places in being in an attempt to circumscribe it, whereas what can be said to be most adequate about God is that is always beyond human words and thoughts. All this is well known, as well as the way in which these Dionysian theories are taken up by the various scholastic authors, Thomas in particular, to try to adapt them to a doctrine which also makes room for the most diverse sources, including Aristotle and Augustine. What seems to me more original to mention is the effect produced by the introduction of the Dionysian doctrines into a theological tradition which was becoming systematized in the 12th, 13th centuries. Before the 12th century, in fact, there was no theology, properly speaking. Admittedly, a theological activity had existed since the fathers of the church, but this activity was exercised rather within a still undefined sacred literature in which Lectio Divina dominated, that is to say, the reading and the commentary of biblical books. In this sacred literature, theology does not yet exist as a distinct science with its specific name, outline, method, and handbook. It is precisely the contribution of the 12th century to, to have given birth to theology as a science by giving it a name, an outline, a method, and a specific handbook. The name theology, which until there signifies either part of the philosophy dealing with intellectibilia, like in Boetius, or a way of speaking of God, like in Dionysus, or even the Bible itself as the word of God, gradually began to designate in the 12th century the study by reason of the content of the Christian faith as it is contained in the scriptures and transmitted by the fathers of the church and the medieval author, doctors. Peter Abelard, through his Theologia Christiana, and Hugh of Saint Victor, through his opposition of the two Theologiae, divine and worldly, played a major role in the apparition of uh, a new uh, Theologia beginning to correspond to what we call thus. The outline of theology is specified at the same time so that it's distinguished both from philosophy and from the explanation of the scriptures to become an autonomous discipline arguing by per rationes and per autoritates. The sentences of Peter Lombard provide such a good example that at the beginning of the 13th century, they became a handbook, the handbook par excellence of the new discipline. The method of theology asserts itself thanks to conflicts between the monastic current, which tends to draw theological activity toward the explanation of the scriptures, and the school current, which tends to draw it towards a kind of Christian philosophy. One of the questions at the heart of the conflict is the possibility of proving the truth of the Christian faith by logical reasoning without this logical demonstration abolishing the divine transcendence. One remember the sentence by Augustine. Uh, if you have understood what you want to say, it's not God. If you have been able to grasp it, you have grasped something else instead of God, because God is transcendent. If, if you think you have been able to grasp it, you have deceived yourself with your own thought. So that's the problem. Every theologian had to face how, with the rays of logic in theology, how to 
have a valid, a very correct logic applied to God without evacuating the divine transcendence. And the problem arises uh, still uh, more in the 11th, 12th century in the world of the schools, of which Béranger of Tours and Peter Bellard are the best representative, because a will, a will is manifested then to prove God by reasoning without the help of the Bible, perhaps in response to an intellectual concern aroused, aroused by the crusade and the encounter with Muslims. It is here that the use of the Europagetic corpus and its theory of divine names plays an essential role. In the 11th century, without knowing such Genesis, Saint Anselm had elaborated an original response to the difficulty posed by the question of a logical demonstration of God who respects his transcendent by building his entire argument in the proslogion on the name quo maius cogitari nequit, that than which nothing greater can be thought. He had shown that by designating God by a negative name. Greater cannot than that than which nothing greater can be thought. So it was possible for him to obtain a reasoning which was logically valid and which was also theologically acceptable since it doesn't say what God is, but what he's not. With the more complete rediscovery of Aristotle, in particular, a more complete organon, including prior and posterior analytics and sophistical refutation, it became more and more possible to develop a rigorous science, demonstrative of God, of God with the risk of totally abolishing divine transcendence, the fact that God, by definition, is greater than what can be thought about him. Otherwise, it is no longer God, no longer God, but something else that is thought in his place. In this place, Pseudo Dionysius brought an apophatic guarantee that scholastic theology lacked to enter fully into the path of a logicization of theology, of theology. Paradoxically, the growing popularity of Pseudo-Dionysus, who in the 13th century became a universal authority in theology, almost as important as Augustine, explained, I think, the success in the universities of a theological discipline scientifically built on the model of the posterior analytics in order to preserve the balance between the two validities, formal and material. In other words, to ensure both the rigor of rational deduction and respect for divine transcendence, it was necessary to counterbalance the log logicization of theology by intro introduction of a heavy dose of negative theology. In this sense, we can say that Pseudo Dionysius, despite himself, I imagine, allowed the triumph of a scientific theology in the scholastic era. Thus was completed the movement which through the 12th and 13th century gradually conferred on theology its name, its object, its autonomy, its structure, its manual, its academic stat status and its method. It was in the 14th, 15th century mainly that people began to read abundantly the last and shortest Dionysian treatise in the manuscript, Mystical Theology. First of all, it must be said that the word mystical has radically changed its meaning since the Middle Ages, so that we have to make a great effort to understand what happened when this treatise was received. Originally, you know, the word mystical had the meaning of silence and secrecy. It qualifies what must remain hidden or unsaid or expressed in a hidden and encrypted way, particularly, particularly within the framework of initiation. The fathers, fathers of the church speak of the mystical meaning of the scriptures to express their allegorical meaning. 
or again, they speak of the mystical body of, the Christ, of Christ to save the sacrament of the priest or the church, which are the object of a mystagogical explanation when one explains how they signify the Christian mystery. With the pseudo Dionysus appears the expression of mystical theology to say a work of stripping down words and concepts which goes beyond even negative theology to realize that even our negative concepts are too limited to speak of God. And that ultimately the most rigorous way to speak of God is beyond affirmation and negation, silence and unknowing. For we know better by realizing that we do not know than by believing that we have known something about God. The intervention of this notion of mystical theology must be understood in the light of what was said earlier about the integration of the theory of the divine names by Latin scholasticism. Indeed, the Dionysian doctrine of the divine names made it possible to resolve the conflict which opposed monks and masters on the use of a logician method in theology. In the university, we therefore see the construction of a scholastic theology, which from generation to generation elaborates more and more fine, precise, sophisticated answers on God, salvation, the sacrament, the last hand. We have thus gone from the Lectio Divina to scholastic theology. We have gone from a poorly differentiated Christian literature, well, well that I uh, say, so, sorry. In short, a gap is growing between the cognitive dimension of Christian faith, which is the object of an increasingly technical speculative theology, and the personal, affective, experiential, existential dimension of the Christian faith, which was everywhere more or less present in monastic literature, but disappears from scholastic literature. It is then that an opposition between scholastic theology and mystical theology appears, taking up the expression from Pseudo-Dionysius, but investing it with new meanings. It is the case in Thomas Gallus and more uh, in John uh, Gerson. Uh, uh, so I'm, I see that I'm really late, so I'm finishing. So this built in the West an opposition, which in my opinion did not exist before the 13th century between a purely cognitive dimension on the one, one hand and on the other, a purely affective and moral dimension of religion. This opposition does not come from the text of Pseudo Dionysus, nor from all pre-scholastic literature, but the text of Pseudo Dionysian, Pseudo Dionysus, provided a terminology which was transformed according to the needs of the time to elaborate an opposition between a scholarly discourse, which comes under the scholastic magisterium, that is to say university, and on the other hand, a religious life which unfolds in piety, devotion, contemplation, morality, prayer and union with God, and sometimes with anti-intellectualism. This great pseudo-Dionysian pseudo break between speculative theology and mystical theology, between knowledge and affectivity, reason and feeling, is probably at the origin of an important aspect of modernity. It must be taken into account in order to understand the devotio moderna, the reformation, the rise and the crisis of what is commonly called mysticism of the 16th and 17th century centuries, not to mention enlightenment, Kantianism. However, as these are periods and philosophical currents in which I'm not competent, I prefer to, to stop here. And it please you to I apologize for having, having been much longer than I thought. Well, thank you very much, Professor Poel, for this uh, magnificent and magisterial exposition of the uh, thought of uh, pseudo Dennis, but also the significance of his oeuvre. I was very struck by the way that you uh, moved from the Carolingian 
Renaissance uh, to the 12th century Renaissance, um, and then on beyond that to what we think of as the uh, the Renaissance pure, um, or the the um, and and into the the modern period. Um, if I could just uh, just start off the uh, just the questions, um, Ficino, obviously the um, a, a great admirer of of Dennis, um, says of and and this is obviously a particular significance to the the work of the center. Um, he says of um, of Dennis, uh, Platonicus primo ac de inde Christianus. Um, now, it was interesting that, that Ficino, himself a priest, uh, should have said that. And of course, this is one of those great vexed issues about the relationship between uh, Dennis and the, his, his Christian and his uh, Platonic provenance. Um, so I just wonder what you'd say about the uh, um, uh, Ficino's comment there, obviously from a great admirer of of uh, of Dennis. Yes, uh, there are of course some ambiguities. For instance, uh, the the hierarchical system makes a place for Christ uh, more uh, problematic because if the, the uh, divine illumination have to come from uh, seraphim to cherubim and so on till angel and from angels to prelates uh, and so on, it's difficult to understand how uh, Christ's incarnation uh, uh, acted directly. Uh, so, yes, uh, there are critics inside the, 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 the Christian uh, world uh, uh, that that are that can be done. And yes, of course, uh, uh, it was criticized to, to to be an intrusion of. Uh, uh, Neoplatonic no paganism uh, into mm. into Christianity. Yes, uh, uh, well, my my opinion is maybe is a little different because I uh, I think that it what would think uh, yes. Uh, well, as I am more um, studying the Latin commentators, uh, I see the struggle to Augustinize the, the, the thought of uh, Soto Dionysus. So, yes, in some way they have the same problem because they try to. Uh, and what strikes me is that the way that, because of the difficulties and because of this problem that you have said, every commentator, every reader, or Latin reader of Sodotonisus uh, makes uh, a, a diverse personal doctrine of uh, Sodotonisus. Uh, so maybe the consequence of what you have said. Mm. Thank you. I'm sure we haven't got a great deal of time, but I'm sure there are a number of questions. So um, we've got a question, we've got a hand up from Joey B and from Clelia. So perhaps in that order. Sure, um, thank you, Professor Perel. Um, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm American and uh, two, two names uh, that are quite important in the understanding of Hugo of St. Victor are, are uh, Paul Roram and Boyd Taylor Kuhlman. And they are of the opinion that Hugh, um, I, I think contrary to your presentation is a marginally Dionysian figure that they downplay the Dionysian elements in Hugh because he only has the singular commentary on celestial hierarchy. But it does seem that you know themes of emanation and hierarchy are present even in something as cataphatic as uh, De Sacramentis. 
So I'm just wondering what your reaction to Paul Roram's position would be. Thank you very much. Actually, we do not disagree <laughs> because what I have presented is the influence exerted by Hughes' commentary uh, among other people more than within his, his own doctrine. I think uh, it's, it's a complicated story, but actually, uh, if we look at the influence of the Hughes' commentary within his other texts, we can say that there is nearly known uh, in the sacramenti, there is a list of angels uh, according to Pseudo Dionysius. Yes. In two, two texts, he speaks about Theophania, which a concept that he takes from uh, the Dionysian corpus, but uh, that's about all. But so, in, in that sense, I agree with uh, Paul Roram and uh, Boy Taylor Coleman, which are which I know well, we have discussed uh, uh, 12 years ago uh, in uh, St. Bonaventure University. But on the other hand, I think they would agree also to say that, uh, well, in, uh, in the, the whole of Hughes' text, we, we have uh, a sort of uh, distant assimilation, not assimilation. Uh, I had a discussion with Paul Roram on the, this word assimilation applied to the relation of Sodonisus and Hugh. Assimilation, not in the sense that uh, Hugh truly uh, imported uh, the, the doctrine the true doctrine of Dionysius in, in his, but in the sense that he uh, made a Huguenian uh, interpretation of it, making more, more uh, Augustinian, more uh, evangelical, more affective. Uh, and uh, that had also a big influence. Uh, and you see, in, in what I explained, I, I said that there were distortions in the way Sodot Dionysius and a part of these distortion were produced by the Hughes commentary uh, because he, as it was the beginning of the success of the Dionysian text, uh, people tended to read uh, Dionysus according to Hugh, but that doesn't mean that, the, that Hugh was truly, truly uh, Dionysian. And another scholar, uh, Chabanimet in Hungary, uh, wrote, and maybe, maybe it's too sharp, but he, he said that uh, um, Hugh, Richard, Walter, uh, Archard were not truly Dionysian. It's only with Thomas Gallus then uh, began a true Dionysism. Uh, and I, I would soften this opposition because even for me, Thomas Gallus is very much influenced by the former Victorian. Uh, but that's true that he learned and he commented uh, always uh, to Sodo Denizu, so it comes closer, yes. Uh, Clelia. Yes, so thank you for the, for the lecture. Uh, actually, you already kind of answered my question thanks to Joey's question. So I would just ask, how, um, what do you think is the aim of the commentary of Hugo of St. Victor? I mean, he, you said that um, of course, uh, Hugh is an exegete, Hugh is also a pedagogist, he is a philosopher, he is a theologian, so he has lots of different uh, sides. Uh, 
and he's of course made his commentary particularly relevant. But what do you think is the most important aim to him? I mean, why did he choose to comment that specific um, part of the Corpus Dionysiacum? It was just for pedagogical point of view or for exegetical point of view? Why did he comment on the celestial hierarchy? Yes, sorry, celestial hierarchy, yeah. I think for a simple reason, uh, Everybody in the 12th century or before, except William of Lucca, does the same. Oh, okay. First, it is the first book in the corpus. Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. And I think that uh, it it was the easier way mm -hmm. entering the Jonism doctrine. Mm. You see, the th the three first chapters uh, do not speak about angels. Yes. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. so this sort of uh, general portal to, to, to the, the, mm. the... And so it was, well, you know of the Ereugen uh, commentary, and he mm -hmm. knew of the glosses by Anastasius, okay. and those glosses were more frequent on the uh, celestial hierarchy. It's the beginning, so okay. more exegetical material, so it's circular. It, as it's easier, it's what people will do prefer. Okay. And so okay. it, I think that it took time to be able to confront the rest progressively. Mm. Okay. Okay. I, I, I get it. Okay. Thank you. And even mystical theology, which is very difficult. Uh, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And understanding correctly divine names, it's nearly impossible to, to, to understand. Yeah, so from this point of view, it's more pedagogic. I mean, there is a very strong pedagogical purpose because otherwise he wouldn't, I mean, he would have chosen maybe something more difficult or maybe something different, but the, maybe the celestial hierarchy is more yes. a sort of summa of the various topics of, okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. And on the, other, on the other hand, I must add that uh, I supposed uh, with some uh, clues that Hugh planned to comment on the whole corpus, but he died. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why I asked also. Yes, of course. May I raise another issue about um, John Scott? Um, and you stress the inadequacies of the translation, of course, and the, uh, um, in a way, the, the, I thought it was a fascinating part of your, your lecture, how, in a way, without influence, uh, Scott's uh, translation uh, was. Um, I, I, I say this because, um, obviously, Meister Eckhart and Nicholas of Cusa might be seen as a very particular reception of uh, Dennis the Areopagite and particularly drawing on the speculative Neoplatonic uh, dimension in a, in a rather radical way that um, prima facie fits in better with John Scott Eriogena than with Richard of Victor's more moderating more Augustinian uh, yes. interpretation. I wonder if you could say something about that. Uh, well, I didn't study the, the way uh, Meister Eckhart and, uh, and uh, Nicolas of Cusa commented on uh, John Jesus. Uh, so, but that's true. Uh, Ariogena, I think, was very little known before the 12th century, but of, with the 12th century, the, the interest, there, there was a re, revival of uh, Ariogenan studies, Donizan studies, and all that. And, uh, but that's true that his very speculative uh, ways uh, well, I think was very disturbing uh, before 13th and, mm. uh, and after it was disturbing, but for other reasons, uh, because 
so close to to to, to say uh, euros. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I don't know exactly about the influence he could have been had uh, on uh, Nicolas of Kuz. Uh, probably in, in... Oh, he did. Oh, definitely. Yes, I think yes. The, because Kuz, of course, was a was a collector of manuscripts, a great collector, and yeah. both um, uh, Dennis and and Ariadna were very important uh, yes. for for Kuza. And in a way, the De Docta Ignorantia, in a way, is the expression of a yes. radically Dionysian position. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, we're slightly over our time, but again, um, 